Hey everybody, David the AI Guide here. Welcome to day two of TED AI. And the next video will be the Applied Artificial Intelligence Conference. So this week we wrap up the trip from mid-October where a million things happen in AI. So day two of TED AI was focused on practical applications of AI and where they stand now. So they called it a product workshop. And here's the kind of things they said. They said applications of AI are not a product. So right now, you know, products are developed and sold to people. The basic premise of day two was that users need products that use AI to make a difference in their life. So they started off with basically a primer on AI and what it is. They said, machine learning is train the brain. Take data, label it, and train the model to understand patterns and to look for specific things. That's machine learning. Then neural nets are for recognizing things, translation, stuff like that. So one of the things that they mention is there's a company called Teachable Machine. You can look this up online, but it's a basic machine learning course. So anyone can take this course on Teachable Machine. So you basically make a no code model, train it and deploy it for a specific use. So the next thing they talked about was the difference between a general product manager and an AI product manager. So product management for products means you help the team and the company to build and ship the right product to customers. AI product management, on the other hand, helps the company solve the right problem using AI. And the right problem is something that's commercially viable. They said to make an AI work takes lots of experimentation to try to solve this problem, and it costs lots of money. They said the focus needs to be on human desirability of what you're doing with the AI. So they talked about some failures in AI to give examples of things not to do. One of them is a company that was called ICQ. And what happened with them is they got off track by trying to make too many new things in too many different areas rather than making one thing and focusing on it. Basically, you need a core offering. Another example of a failure they gave was Google Glass. It was too far ahead of its time, so timing is important in developing and releasing an AI to the market. And then they mentioned a failure in product management blockbuster. They wouldn't adopt, they would not adapt to new technology that came in. And this can happen while you're preparing an AI and will definitely happen as the exponential speed of AI continues to increase. So they said what you're looking for is the right product for the right market and no disruptors coming in and tearing your business that you're working on to pieces. In AI, they said there's three Ps, automating processes, so process, pattern recognition, and prediction. Those are the big three Ps of AI to recommend, to match, to suggest, to generate content. So they said the real goal of generative AI is maximum learning with the least effort. And they said when you're developing something new, you just want it to be good enough and then release it. You are not trying to get it perfect before you release it. You can't wait that long. You're looking to do something that adds value day one, but then can get better and better and better over time. So next up, they started talking about what's coming in healthcare because healthcare is clearly one of the lead markets for AI. So the first guy that spoke was a guy named Daniel Kraft, and he founded two different companies, Nextmed.health, which sold, I guess, and Digital.health. Then there was a guy from Google whose name was Vivek, and he was talking about what they're working on in healthcare which is called MedPalm 2. So it's a very specialized foundation model for healthcare. They said this new MedPalm 2 is multimodal, meaning text, 
pictures, scans, all that stuff, plus analysis. He said this new MedPalm 2 will roll out within the next few months. So we're talking about very early 2024. He said MedPalm 2 is like an AI doctor combined with an AI research scientist. Then there was a woman named Renee from NVIDIA, and she was talking about what NVIDIA is doing in healthcare. They have invented something that they call Clara. So Clara is used for new medical devices, drug discovery, virus evolution, and biology, she said. Then there was a professor from Duke, a professor of psychiatry. His name is Dr. Morali, and he was saying that there's 8 billion people in the world right now, right? 1 billion of those people have significant mental health illness. That's really a big, much bigger percentage than I thought. One out of eight. He said 400 million people in the world suffer from severe depression. He said 70% of this billion people can't even access mental health care right now. So that's 700 million people who are mentally ill, but they cannot access mental health care. So he said only about 30% of people with mental illness get remission. And of that 30% that got remission, 30% of those had an optimal outcome and the rest did not. So he said what will really make a difference is a specialized chatbot for psychiatric care that can be distributed globally easily. And he said that this chatbot could do several things. First, digital health coaching. Reducing, second, reducing the stigma around mental health issues. Three, triage and suicide prevention. And number four, clinical support for psychiatrists. He said, if you are suffering, there is a crisis text line, which I didn't even know about. He said, you text connect, the word connect, to 741741. They've received over 100 million texts already. So a digital mental health coach needs to show a lot of empathy. And he mentioned one called PACO, P-A-K-O. So then there was a guy named Ashok, and he was from Carillon Digital Health, which is a huge company. <laughs> uh, Carillon has 119 million members in its health plan. So they have a ton of data. They're using generative AI to lower the cost of providing health care for growth, adding more people to their membership, for automation, and for new solutions to existing medical problems. He said one of the things their system will do is give you a personalized match to a doctor based on everything in your medical profile. He said this is greatly improving care. And then finally, they're using AI for improving claim processing and automation. So uh, Ashok went on to say it's critical in healthcare to have responsible AI, which he defined as fair, inclusive, private, secure, and robust. He said its outcomes need to be explainable, transparent, and the organization needs to be accountable. However, he said any AI tool created must fit the realities of practice and how medical practice actually occurs in terms of the interaction with the patient today. He said the best use of AI is to give a quick summary and a course of action. He said the biggest problems in healthcare are first and foremost access Worldwide, many people don't have access to health care, cost, and then quality. Next, he said AI can really make a difference in drug development. He said average drug development of a new drug takes 10 years. And so they're trying to shorten that. So faster, personalized to specific people and get people better access to that medication. And what he said is for niche populations, you have to use a simulation to develop the AI to address their health issues. So this is rare diseases and stuff like that. 
So next up was a panel uh, that was titled AI Transforms Urban Life, and this is definitely coming. Uh, there were four people on it. There was a guy named Phil from Zooks, which is running fully autonomous level five robo taxis in San Francisco, Seattle, and Las Vegas right now. Then there was Annabelle from Waymo, they're in San Francisco, LA, Arizona, and just launching in Austin. And the third person was Dan Katz, who's with a company called Hayden AI. And that AI is being used on buses in New York City. I'll explain more on that in a minute. So Annabelle from Waymo said the issue they're facing right now is just people getting used to it. And she gave a great example. She said they first rolled out autonomous rides, meaning no driver, in Phoenix in 2020, three years ago already, three and a half maybe. She said because it had been rolled out that long ago, no one even looks or pays attention to autonomous taxis now in Phoenix. They're just widely accepted and that's human nature right something new sticks out but once you, you see it for a while it becomes part of the background she said however in la where they're just rolling out she was in one of the robo taxis one of the first ones in february of 2023 and everyone stopped to look at it so that's the difference so she said what they're working on now is a feedback loop to make adjustments to each city that they roll out to because each city is different. So Phil from Zook says they're launching their new full robo taxi with zero controls in it, just seats. He said one of the great benefits of their system so far is that it's really helping the cities that have used them improve bad intersections in two ways. One is traffic flow and the other is intersections where a lot of accidents occur. They're telling cities from their data how to fix that intersection to cut out, cut down the accidents. Another thing that their Zooks vehicles are doing is notifying the cities where they're in when signs are missing or that the ones that are there are out of date and need to be updated. And then finally their vehicles are sending rerouting instructions to first responders who are on the way to accidents to make the, help them get there faster. So there's a lot of good benefits coming out of these robo taxis. Then Hayden AI, what they did is a few year, starting a few years ago, they put their AI vision system on city buses in New York City. And at that time there was a huge problem which is people just pulling over and stopping or parking in the dedicated bus lanes and really interfering with operation of the buses. So what does the Hayden system do? It notifies police and the people parked in these bus lanes get automatic tickets now in New York City. So what is the effect of this been only after only three years? A 36% increase in the speed at which buses are able to move through Manhattan and collisions are down between 20 and 30 percent depending on the route. So now Hayden is rolling out beyond New York City to Washington DC, LA, and the East Bay which is Oakland. So all three said one of the cool things that they're doing is their data sharing among all their vehicles loading zones to find good places for these robo taxis to pull over and be out of the way to discharge or let passengers on. And furthermore, as I mentioned a second ago, they're training first responders how to interact with these robo taxis and helping them find better ways to accidents. So Annabelle from Waymo describes something really cool that they did in Phoenix. So Phoenix is really spread out and they've been there for several years now. So what they did is there's a lot of elderly people who live outside of the bus lane. In other words, they would have to walk a mile or two or three to get to the nearest bus route because they live on the edges of the city. Well, what Waymo is doing is partnering with the Phoenix bus system to give these people a ride 
included with their bus ticket from their house to the nearest bus stop to go where they want to go. So that's really cool. This is how these things are going to work over time. All of these people said governments don't really know how to best use new technology. They lag behind. And they also said that over the next 10 years, these robo-taxis are going to roll out to many, many more cities. And one of the last things that they're working on, which I've talked about in earlier videos, is these vehicles will roll out to cities where the climate is more challenging. But to do that, they have to have heater units for the sensors that these robo-taxis use so that the sensor stays clear all the time and doesn't get covered by snow or ice or even fog in foggy places. The biggest thing they said was, right now rules are state by state and they need national rules to be able to roll out robo-taxis in a uniform way. So all of these systems learn as they drive and Hayden specifically mentioned, it learns as it drives the route every day, missing signs, graffiti, illegal parkers, it alerts the city. So what is happening in Manhattan is that it's, this AI is evening the playing field between cars and buses. And Manhattan is taking the next step. I did a short on this recently. Uh, Manhattan, starting March of 2024, will charge a relatively high surcharge to drive a car into Manhattan south of 60th Street. And then eventually one day, private passenger vehicles won't be allowed. It'll all be robo-taxis. But the guy from Hayden said all of these autonomous systems are still geofenced. So in other words, they're only permitted and allowed to work in a specific area, not just everywhere. Uh, but eventually they will learn enough and get good enough to not be geofenced. And then the last thing they said is one of the remarkable things about these fleets is they share everything. So it becomes one big learning brain, basically. So the last panel I saw at TED AI Day 2, because I had to leave to go to the Applied Artificial Intelligence Conference, which will be the next video, was Responsible AI. And that means understanding what's happening inside of algorithms, how companies use them, and government and regulation. So there's a, a part of Stanford, an institute called the Stanford Center for Foundation Models. And they said that transparency is the most important thing with AI because that builds trust, it's safe for consumers, and you get better policy making. So they said still today, making a foundation model is hard and most foundation models fail. And they said another problem is that data sets still contain a lot of bias in them. So in terms of transparency and trust, that opens the question of, do you want to release all that data? But then that'll violate privacy for a lot of people, right? So at this panel, there was a USC professor who spoke at the regular TED event the day before. And she said, there's really no actual way to make AI models transparent. What you're looking for is explainability rather than transparency, meaning you can explain how the model works, but you don't know everything in the model. And there was another guy named Tom on this panel, and he said, the rush to roll out models pushes against the obligation of responsibility with AI, so they need to stop rushing out these models. They said the whole for-profit ecosystem that all of these AI companies and big tech companies are operating under is not conducive to responsibility. So we need to change the, the incentives so that responsibility is the first priority. And basically the panel members said, you know, will responsible AI fall behind the Wild West rushing people? And they said in the short run, yes, but not in the long term, they won't. And the USC professor said, in reality, the price to make these models fair is small, not big. So it really should be done. And there was a woman from PricewaterhouseCoopers, a big accounting firm on the panel. She said, partnerships and communication 
are important and can make these models transparent. So that's it for TED AI day two and TED AI in general. Mind bending stuff, as you can tell. Listen to the next video, the Applied AI Conference, because they're going to lay out very clearly what's about to happen. So thanks so much for tuning in. Please subscribe. We're at 991, almost to 1,000. Please subscribe. Also like and share these videos. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks for your comments. I do my best to respond to those in between working full time and doing this YouTube channel. And my viewers for a little while know that I had written a book about AI. I'm writing a new book. So there's a lot going on at the moment and patience with me is appreciated right now. But uh, all of this will be finished in a few months. So thanks so much. Take care. See you next time. Bye.